Welcome to the State of Survival, folks, and today is a special episode because we have the Humid Z developer, Yaza, here to represent the Humid Z game team and talk about the progress and what went into making this beautiful top-down survival game. Yaza, it is a pleasure to have you here, and Jarl, it is awesome to have you here during this interview. So, Yaza, you are the owner of uh, Humid Z? Correct, yeah, joint owner, but yeah, owner, yeah. Oh, nice. And so who is the other owner? Uh, CV Dub. Unfortunately, he can't be here today, but yeah, it's just me. Oh, that's wonderful. So uh, Human Z started out as what kind of an idea? Like what got you guys wanting to make this game? Uh, it's come from years of playing survival games for me, really. Um, I'm a big, big DayZ fan. So playing that game and playing other games, it was kind of an idea that when you play survival games, you probably, I know you guys might play a couple of survival games, right? Being a survival podcast. Just a couple. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm just um, <laughs> So like, you know that feeling when you play like a game, like State of Decay, I love State of Decay, for example. But there was like little things about that that you can't build a base everywhere. It's like set in like a, you know, in a set place. So like there's little things in games that you play I was like, I'd like to just get a game and go, right, I love that idea from that game and this game and that game, and then try and, like, you know, amalgamate them all into, like, one game. Um, and that's kind of where the idea come from. So I was kind of scouring the web on YouTube and stuff like that. And then CV was actually making a survival game, and he was, like, posting videos on YouTube about it. And I was like, hey, that looks, like, similar to kind of the idea that, like, I want to make and stuff. So... I literally just messaged him like out the blue said, you know, I know everything about survival games. I'm going to make the best game ever. Let's do it. Let's do it. And, you know, he weirdly accepted and like we become best mates literally from kind of that day really through the internet and humanity kind of just started from me and him getting together and putting our ideas together and our different influences. So that's like the basics of it really of where it's come from. Yeah, you know, it is a very beautiful looking game and a lot of the mechanics in it make a lot of sense with survival. And that's one of the things I really enjoy about it is that they don't, you didn't make the game unnecessarily hard just to be hard, but you didn't make it, make it easy. It kind of is a good balance when it comes to the law of the survival mechanics. And of course, I'm sure that balance will change. But, you know, I love a lot of features about survival games. I think one of my most favorite um, features of survival games is when they rely upon crafting as one of the major points of well, the survival. What are the, the main features that you guys were like, we need to have this in the game for us to actually enjoy this game? Um, build Anywhere was like a priority in the beginning. So, you know, like if you want to go and live in the woods and like, you know, be among the bears and the wolves and stuff, you can go and do it. Um, or if you want to build a you know, like take over a town maybe and fence it off and do kind of like a walking dead and make like some kind of, you know, gated community or something. Or do you want to just find a little house somewhere, board up the windows and start a little farm? Like it was kind of, I wanted it to be that kind of like, you get to choose like what you want to do and where you want to live. That was like one of the early sort of statements that we wanted to put into the game. You told us that you started off pretty much with just you and your co-owner. How has your team expanded since you guys started getting going? Um, it's just had to. <laughs> There's no other no other way around it. Like, um, I think last year, um, like even with a team of five, I didn't have a single holiday last year. Like, I worked pretty much every day even weekends and stuff you know i got like a wife and two kids as well so lo and behold they just let me get on with it as well and i'm still trying to play you know dad and husband and stuff like that but um so yeah it's been, it's been really tough so having extra people on the team is like massive i could i think i'd probably be six foot under if it was just the two of us to be honest so um having a team is, is massive because you can call upon each other share the workload the stress the ups and the downs and stuff like that um so yeah, as the game's grown and with the multiplayer and the servers and stuff, like having staff is just is key, to be honest. Who is all on your team now? How like and what are their jobs inside of your development? 
Okay, so there's me, um, who's the lead game designer, and everything else probably in between. Um, CV Dub, he's the lead dev uh, and owner with me, it was like we just discussed. Um, and then the Zerk, uh, who is another developer. We've got Kai, who's like a systems developer. Uh, MK is the 3D art and environmental artist. And then the sixth person, I suppose, is uh, Dara, who's our lead tester and uh, general just good guy helping us on the Discord. It sounds like, you know, your team really developed over time, but did you guys actually start out with any experience in the game development market? Have you ever developed games in the past or were you ever part of a team that developed games? Nope. No, this is our first ever game. First ever game. So how did you guys end up choosing the engine that you guys decided to go with? Like what actually made you choose? Um, I was kind of, I've always been into like game design stuff for years. Cause my job before this was like an IT support role. So, um, and I was doing DJing and producing as well. So like, um, using a PC is like a massive side of like, you know, the creation process and all that kind of thing. So, um, I've always been messing around with Unity and Unreal, but Unreal just sat better with me because I'm not like technically minded, like writing like code. So using the visual scripting in Unreal just kind of just felt easier to, to do. And this felt like, you know, there's good resources online and stuff like that. So um, that was kind of like my pathway into it really, to be honest. And then obviously COVID hit in. Um, there wasn't much work on and stuff. So I really like kicked on with like learning and sort of developing skills in, in game design. And then it just kind of just snowballed from there. Really. You told us the engine you like to use and everything else. What creation hurdles do you guys have had since deciding to make this game all the way up until the current day? I would say like multiplayer <laughs> just comes with like so many issues like replication like we started off with just single player and then we went like peer-to-peer -peer co-op and then now we've gone to like dedicated servers with like 15 16 i think we're up to 24 players now the servers can hold so um that was like tough because like there's one thing learning to make a game um and there's a reason why people make single player games is because multiplayer is like hard it's not easy it's just really not um so that come with a lot of issues. The localization was tough as well. Um, that was like a first time thing for like the whole team. Like they'd never done that before. Um, and that comes at a cost because if you get that wrong, you can really annoy people. So, you know, negative reviews and stuff like that. Um, we were able to join with little issue. Um, we did have some ping issues occasionally, uh, but Right after we started experiencing those, there was a fix put out this fall that really stabilized the gameplay. Yeah, thanks. It's not, and it's not, it's not easy to test that either. You can, you can do stuff in the engine, which is like, you can fake like high ping and packet loss and all that kind of stuff. But until you throw it out there in the world and like people have got different PCs, different internet at home, the different distance they are away from each other, like that's kind of why we were doing a lot of fast fixes on the back of that because it was like oh my god the ping and then you know we'd like oh shit and then we'd like patch it and stuff like that so and what's cool about this whole situation is that it sounds like you kind of kind of learned from your mistakes when it's you know first came to multiplayer because i have read that you guys now have like experimental uh pushes which are really beautiful but you also have like dedicated experimental server teams who can help you guys test these kind of situations and stuff like not necessarily on your development team, but they kind of volunteer to help you with the earlier multiplayer stuff, right? Yeah, big time, yeah. Some people just, like, love the game, live for the game and stuff. Some people, it's their life, right? These survival games, you get that a lot. I think it's probably one of the most, I don't know, passionate game people out there, survival games, it feels like. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm biased, but that's kind of what it feels like. So these people want to help because they want to get a good game you know, out the other end. So yeah, it's that's awesome from the community, really. Well, and I think a lot of us who've played survival games have gotten into this culture um, 
you don't really hear people in the survival game genre complaining too much that a game is early access. I mean, we played DayZ when it was a mod and it was being developed live on Arma 2. And we're just accustomed to it. We've embraced the culture. We've actually kind of asked for it. Um, if something's wrong, we're always willing to provide feedback. Sometimes it's sometimes you get negative feedback, but I think you get less negative blowback with survival games than you do FPSs or RPGs. And that's actually brings us kind of to a good point is what kind of community have you been building or actually pushed yourself to building? Because from what I see, it looks like you have a pretty dedicated uh, community trying to really work with you and to really promote your game, not only just playing it, but also giving feedback and suggestions like that feedback uh, channel you guys have in Discord is filled with people giving proper feedback and everything else. And uh, plus uh, Dara for responding to all of them promptly and trying to uh, organize yeah. the chaos of what it is usually feedback on any kind of game. Um, yeah, like the, the community for us is like, um, I think we're up to like 6,000 members right now in, in Discord. Wow. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's growing pretty well. Um, and we, the, I think what sort of takes people back is we actually listen to them mm -hmm. and we like, we've got our own vision, but we've got this like percentage of our ears that we kind of take in. Like we've got like the full feedback. People probably just think it's like a place that we like document the whole thing and we look at them. And then we, you know, we take it away from the Discord and we discuss it with the team and stuff like that. And we're like, you know, that's no good. That's no good. We've already have that. And then we're like, okay, wow, that could be, you know, because we can't take everything right. But there is, there is gems in there that we just wouldn't have thought of ourselves. So um, that's kind of the joy of a good community and early access because there's been a lot of games recently that have become, you know, the, the scam word gets used a lot now, especially around survival games. So. It yeah. makes like our job harder because we're a new game. We're in early access, so like, you know, the, all eyes are on us. Are we going to be a scam? Are we going to like, you know, quit development and stuff like that? But um, hopefully, our community know that you know this is like our our passion. It's like a third child for me, anyway. Um, and yeah, the community have just been awesome. I, you know, um, I went over and met a few at PAX, which was also my first time in the states. So I flew over there and stuff like that. So. Um, you know, and people DM me about stuff as well about the game, like away from it. And I know some devs might get annoyed about, you know, their inbox being full and stuff. But I, you know, if someone wants to talk to me about humanity, then you know, this is why I'm here on this podcast as well to talk about it. But yeah, the community's been great, and they're helping really drive drive the game forward and keep us going as well because it's hard sometimes. You know, you, you know, we might push an update that maybe not everyone likes, and then you do a new update and then it replies and everyone likes that. And then it's kind of like a pat on the back for us. And you can, we're kind of all in it together in a way. So yeah, it's, it's great. I did have some issues with just how easy it felt like to survive and CV dub. That's actually when I met CV dub was in chat and said, Oh, Hey, we've got a custom difficulty slider and taught me how to use it. And that was when a light bulb popped in my head because Dumpgraw, Dimension, and I, we play games pretty aggressively on as hard a settings as we could. But then we had somebody who wanted to join us and, and play on our server. So we just saved the game, exited, I reloaded it, set the difficulty down to where they would enjoy it as well. And just having that flexibility of controlling the population, how aggressive the zombies are, their health, their speed, mm -hmm. um, and just the nature of how often does loot respawn. We we make it pretty long so that you're not just staying in one area with no reason to go out. And once we catered it to our experience, it felt like our own game, which I think is really unique to humanity. No, no mods were needed to bend it in that direction. We were able to fine tune it to our play style, and that was massive. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I like that because that was a choice that we made because we wanted to give, like, like the nightmare mode. I mean, you've played the nightmare mode and tried that, yeah. Um, but like, we wanted that to kind of be like the default because me, like you, I want like low loot. I want to nearly die and then find like it's in a tuner or something, right? That's kind of how I want to play a survival game. But some people maybe don't want to cope with that, so I'm like. I don't want to discard them from playing this game. So that was kind of the reason to sort of give these 
sliders, like you say, you can get people into the genre maybe that are new, that are kind of okay, and then they can ramp it up later and join you guys with like you know some kind of death server where you're never going to survive anyway. So um, having that choice, I think, is really important for for us as devs to do stuff like that, but for the players as well. But when we were first playing it, and we didn't know that option was there because it's just kind of it's very discreet in the option line. We had guns and we were just standing there like the expendables, just opening fire on zombies in the street, like ah. Ha, ha, ha. But once you turn PvP on, you have to be a lot more careful. Uh, bullets hurt a lot. Spears hurt even worse sometimes. <laughs> are you kidding me? Golf clubs are the worst. That that that, oh, that swing, that reach. <laughs> you know what? That's fine. Preacher has never done golfing very much. Uh, that backswing. <laughs> I think Dimension oh, ate a that's... few of those nine irons. <laughs> he did. I think. He, I think a couple of us. I think two of us went down with one swing one time. <laughs> <laughs> that was so funny. But I like that because think... you guys are telling telling stories about your your playing, and that that's the side that I really passionate about. Is like, you know, is there any end game or is there like a story and stuff like that? And I'm like, well, no, not yet. Maybe in the future, but like. The players are telling the story right now. You know, you killed your teammate by mistake, or you know, you did this and did that, and they're kind of the, the little, the little tales and the little stories that I really like to sort of find out about. Yeah. So I love all the customizable settings, and I'm really happy you thought about the you know amateur player all the way to the veteran from hardcore wannabe to diet survival awesomeness and everywhere in between. But you mentioned that you love stories the most. I'm pretty sure you guys had some pretty hilarious stories. Uh, play testing your game when you're developing it. Come on, tell us one of them. You mentioned Raptor before, right? I mm -hmm. think that's how you've seen the game originally. Is that right? Yeah, I, I saw him um, on YouTube and I started watching him live play it. It was amazing. Yeah, so uh, I actually met him at PAX. Actually, that was really nice to meet him in person. So that was cool. Um, so we sent him the game on Google Drive. Like it wasn't even like on Steam or anything like that. This We're talking like crappy alpha version but he was like really keen he loves like indie games and stuff like that and you know he's a big pull on the community and stuff like that so we were like let's just go for it and see what happens and we were all like nervously waiting i think dubs was like having like a mild panic attack about to watch it and then the game starts it loads up there's like thousands of people watching he loots he goes to loot the car he opens up the bonnet and then the car just disappeared and then he like freezes and pauses for a minute and i'm like oh my god man and like we were just dying inside so like things like that you kind of like learn from because we were kind of like key to give it to someone to show it but maybe it was like a little bit too soon but it's one of those things that we remember in the studio forever yeah that uh, raptor basically like broke our hearts within like 30 seconds of streaming but but we can laugh about it now I couldn't think of a better person to help get your game on the market because Raptor is honest. <clears throat> I would say honest to a yeah. fault. He'll poke fun when the game glitches, but he'll also turn around and let his audience know this is normal. This is game development. If you like yeah, game development, awesome. this, this is it. But he's he is positive in his criticisms. Uh, if there's a game that he plays that he does not like because of the mechanics, he's very up forward with his community he's like this game needs some time to cook i don't like the direction they're taking it but when he does it he doesn't think all right let's grab the torches and pitchforks so no. it, it was remarkable to have him of all people trying it because he doesn't just let his bias or love of previous games get in the way of it He's played it ever since. He'd never stopped playing it, so it must be yeah. really a good thing. So, yeah. I like those kind of stories, too, because, you know, it's not always happy, fun times, but, like, you guys, you guys learned from it, you improved from it, and it's great that you, like Jarl said, used Raptor from what Jarl just said. It sounds like he was a great, you know, first one to show you how to break the game. <laughs> yeah, we can't, yeah, we can't thank him enough, really, to be honest, so. Yeah, yeah the, the bugs, like, hurt a lot if that makes sense. They're like, mm -hmm. um, you, you don't want them in your game. So like in the oh, yeah. early stages, we were like pumping out updates. Like, you know, we do, we do like an update and then there'd be like a day one hot fix, you know, cause a small team, you can't catch everything. Right. Once, you know, thousands of people start playing, we're like, Oh no, this is broke. That doesn't work or something we missed. And then, you know, we might do an update the next week and then another one and then another big update. And we were kind of just pumping them out, pumping them out because, 
like they hurt like the most it's like you know someone saying something bad about your child or something you like you want to fix it you want to get it sorted and that's kind of like how how it feels so we've kind of done pretty well on the bugs the bugs are getting less and less which is which is good but now people are like where's these updates come on like it's been two weeks i'm like dude like no other game pumps out as many updates as we do they just do not do it as much as us and we're like a team of like two three five now six um so yeah we're kind of coping with that but yeah the bugs and stuff like that we we do try our best to to fix them as quick as we can now speaking about your guys's uh early sets of bugs and everything else do you guys push all of your future stable updates to experimental first yeah that's that's the plan now yeah this team is small they clearly don't have an entire qa team under their belt you are the qa team so if you do enable experimental just kind of take on that mantle of, you know, self-imposed responsibility and realize that it's it's not so that you can rant and rave about a bug that's broken. Instead, these developers are very open to speaking their community. Tell us about PAX East. That must have been a really exciting experience for you guys. Yeah, it was. We weren't actually, like, featured this time. It was the Freedom Games, our publisher, that were there. Um so it was kind of like a business meeting for me to meet the publishers. Uh, I got to meet uh, Dubs for the first time in like the flesh in real life. I met Dara nice. in real life as well. Um, and then, yeah, I met quite a few streamers and content creators and stuff like that. So I just kind of floated around, spoke to other devs of other games. And um, yeah, it was just a good day. I took my family and stuff as well. They really enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, it was really, it's an awesome, awesome experience to be honest. That is super awesome to hear about. Now, are you going to be possibly attending other kind of gaming conventions in the future? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. Especially when we're, I can't say too much, but when the game obviously goes to like 1.0, whenever that is, there's probably going to be tied into an event as well. So it's probably going to be pretty nice. big, that one. Uh, so your guys' game has so many cool features in it. And I would say I love the base building itself. Now, I'm a big lover of base building in most survival games. But what I liked about your guys' system is that you guys really kind of played into taking over existing buildings. It is not required, but it's so easy to do. It's almost kind of second nature in the game to want to take over a building and fortify it instead of just building out the wilderness, which you can do. And I love that. But... That's one of my most favorite features. What about you, y'all? What's one of your favorite features about the game that just stands out to you? I've got two. One, primitive survival. Uh, a lot of times when you're playing these games, I mean, DayZ has some primitive survival. I think a lot of people don't realize you can take a hammer to a rock and start making stone knives. You don't have to look for the little stones on the ground. Things like that that might take a while to learn. Uh, we learned real quick in Humanity because we showed up to a house that had no tools, food galore, but no tools. And we're like, well, how the heck are we? And what I love about it is when you go into the crafting menu, it shows you everything you can craft and how you craft it. It's not that you have to do the guesswork. Uh, there's, you know, not that you have to go online to find out how to make a splint in Day Z. It's just right there. When we first encountered the armored Zeke on, uh, at the police wreck near the beginning starter location, <laughs> I remember one of us shooting an arrow. We hear this clear metal ding. And we're all like, oh, oh, I'm not sure if we can actually <laughs> shoot that thing in the head. And then like, you were all like, no, let me deal with it. And you shot it again. And the helmet goes flying off. And I just remember that being a aha moment. You have to aim at the head and stuff. And it can feel quite satisfying once you kind of get good at that aim and you're popping heads off and stuff like that. So, yeah, the shooting mechanics in the game. I'm proud of them oh. by the team. I quite like the driving in the game, and that wasn't made by me. That was fully made by dubs. I really enjoy the driving of the game, like in a top-down, like the whole mm -hmm. thing with the engine and getting a car up and running. It's not like you just jump straight into a car and drive it. You know, it needs parts and fuel and all that kind of stuff. So I quite like the, the car mechanic side. It's like a quest in itself. Um and then probably the quest system that isn't in the game yet. That's probably going to be my Ooh. my favorite thing, yeah. 
your arrows and your crossbow bolts actually stick to services and to the uh, infected or Zeeks. And what's cool about it is like a lot of games do have crossbows and boats and bolts and stuff like that. But the thing is, is they usually have like the bows spawn in the inventory or like they end up like immediately disappearing like they're a one use kind of situation. And it's really cool. Your guys is just like I said, stick into the Zeeks or the ground and they're retrievable most times. But there's also a percentage chance for them to break. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it was, it was actually better than that a while ago because we changed how the zombies worked. A bit of like development sort of conversation here, but um, they used to like so. Say if you shot them in like the head or the shoulder or whatever, and then when they died, they would actually be in that part of the zombie, which was awesome. But every zombie in the map was using the like full character blueprint movement mm. component, and that is like so heavy. So if you got like you know if you want like fifty zombies on screen, it was absolutely tanking us. So they use a basic pawn movement controller now. Um, so it takes a lot of work to get those arrows. So they're not as like precise as what they were before, but they do drop on the ground where the zombie is. And we kind of went, well, well, that's better than people go in. This game sucks because I've got like two frames. So, yeah. One of the other features that recently just came in, this last update, is multi-story buildings. Like you can explore them now and you can build them with the new stair buildable item. Like I know at first you guys had a lot of buildings where the stairwell was blocked off. Was that yeah. on purpose and then the multi-story later was coming out or was it kind of, what was it? Yeah, we just we just kind of run out of time on that really. It takes a lot of um, coding to get that right. It seems simple, but because top down, so you go into the bottom floor, the ground floor say, through the door and then at the minute the roof hides and it's nice and easy because you've got one floor no problem but then if you add multiple floors you've got people running around maybe on the floor above you so you don't want to hide the roof and then see this guy like running around like floating on an invisible floor you have to hide that actor who's above you maybe someone crafts something upstairs so then when you walk in that bottom floor you don't want to see what's above you it still has to hide it so there's quite a lot of like technical stuff that has to go on um so we kind of run out of time so we just push that back and like we're going to add more buildings there's still quite a few single story with the stairs blocked but that's kind of like very apocalyptic anyway maybe people just died up there and they blocked it and that was kind of it but um well it definitely caught me by surprise when i wandered into a small um parking lot and started dealing with some hostile humans I didn't expect to be open fire upon <laughs> from the upper window. And I was like, oh, dang, I didn't. I knew it was out, but that didn't dawn on me that they would do that. And I, I just ran and hid. I was like, uh. <laughs> I love it. Well, not to say, the multi-story buildings so far have been really good. I haven't fallen through the stairs. I haven't glitched or anything like that my entire time. Um, and even on my own base building objects, uh, I know collisions can be difficult on some things like that. One of the things I enjoyed about the game was that you had these things from the get-go. You had zombies, which almost every survival game that promotes zombies has them right away. But then you're all like, yeah, we have NPCs from the get-go. There is no like waiting period for the NPCs to come in. And I really enjoyed that on initial release, that's kind of how you had it, right? What I enjoy about the system is I was reading through your feedback uh, tracker and I saw somebody talking about NPCs having unlimited ammo. And I saw that the response from uh, Dara was that actually the NPCs have like 300 bullets or something like that. And it's really cool to find out that they actually do have a bullet count because I honestly was under the impression that they did. But, uh, you know, that, that's just something cool, a detail that as a player I never really experienced yet, but it is actually there. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it was a thing that I think it would annoy you, right, if they just, like, constantly... Because you're in a survival game, so if you're on low loot settings, you're not going to have 300 rounds yourself. But the reason we give them 300 rounds is because they actually fight zombies as well. So you might stumble across... The horde might be tracking you, but on their path, they might stumble upon a bandit camp. So they will go, ah, oh, cool, fresh meat. So then you might hear gunshots going off, and then you can kind of third party maybe go over and you can, that is actually a really good 
tip actually you can actually take out a bandit camp quite easily when they're getting attacked by zombies because they're like distracted um so they need those extra rounds because like if they're just fighting you one-on-one maybe 300 rounds might be too much but why would you fight someone with a gun if you don't have a gun yourself right it's like it's, it's a stupid decision to make so um yeah, as soon as those rounds run out, they switch over to a melee weapon that they have. So. It sounds like you can actually lead these Zeeks over and cause your own little, you know, raid with the Zeeks on them, which could be fun. You know what, Dump? Yeah. Next time we play, we really have to, if we can get at least one of those old gremlins running or those little little uh, hatchbacks, we need to just do the Walking Dead thing and slowly drive and hey, <laughs> hey, you know, uh, and, and carry a horde to the bandit camp. Because all we'd have to do is drive through it. Once the Zeds, the Zeke see the bandits, dinner time. <laughs> Give it a go. Give it a go. I have to say, one of the cool features about your car uh, mechanics was that you actually have to get up to speed to do damage to Zeke's and uh, NPCs. You can't just go five miles an hour, but, 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 but you actually have to have enough speed to do it. And they hurt the car a lot every time you hit it. And I, I really enjoy that detail. Yeah, that was something we wanted in there because um, I think like my wife helped do that feature because she doesn't play games that often and she really likes humanity, which is a good a good thing for me. She doesn't play games at all, not a gamer. She, she likes your third humanity. child, that's good. Yeah, 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 <laughs> which is, it's, it's a bonus. Um, but she was like, it was great watching her play because she was like so scared of the zombies. Like she would just say in the car, I'm not getting out, I'm not getting out. And she would like sit in the car and there'd be loads around her. Or she would use the car as a weapon. And I was like, well, we can't have people like cheesing the game and just like staying in the car and just slowly running over zombies. So that was kind of one of the reasons that um, it's as it is. I'm kind of realistic in a way, you know, in some form. Um, and we've made the zombies like do a lot of damage to the cars as well for that reason. So you can't just kind of mow them down. You know, you've got to, you know, be brave and get out there and do some damage to them. I didn't know if it was just my bad driving or if it was actually something that was applying to the car, but it really feels like the weathers have, have something. They change the environment so much, whether it's surviving because of temperature or getting wet, getting sick more often, but it feels like you can't just hide in a car and turn your heater on and be like, okay, we're good now. <laughs> Yeah, it's probably come from Dubs's uh, long dark influence, probably. So the wet, the weather side of things, because obviously I played a little bit of that game, not much, but yeah, it's it's a huge, a huge game for him. So the kind of weather, the temperature, the freezing cold, all that kind of stuff has come from probably that influence. Yeah, which I love. I know Dump gets tired of me here saying this, but I think the number one enemy in any survival game should be Mother Nature. You know, you can have zombies, you can have you know cannibals you can have mutants or or militants but mother nature should be that one enemy that you cannot tame and i i really feel like you you did that well awesome yeah. thanks yeah i like i like it too i like how uh your world actually changes when the weather changes there are many survival games i have played and i love them all but i miss and really enjoy when a game like yours allows snow to come out and the accumulation of snow and I love the, uh, I forget what it's called, but the the paths in the snow. You actually have the paths mm -hmm. in the snow uh, as an unreal feature. And that's always nice to see because there's one thing for your texture set on the ground to change to snow, but it's another thing to actually see yourself walking through the snow. Yeah, the, the snow, yeah. Yeah, the snow footprints are like a poor man's Red Dead, I think. Not quite as good as Red Dead, but it's it's footprints in the snow, so it's it's good enough. But with the animal hunting, too, that's that's really important because that's how we caught a deer last time we played is we, we were like, wait, this isn't our track. And we found there were deer nearby. Is there anything else you guys want to talk about in the game that you really enjoy? Maybe something that you worked on, Yuza, that you are really proud of or such? All the sound stuff has come from me, come from my, because I did uh, DJing and uh, producing before becoming a game dev um that sort of responsibility fell on me i didn't create every sound in the game but um a lot of it was done through layering and just using cubase and kind of that kind of thing so yeah like the gunshot sounds and stuff are like 
hundreds of sounds that we've had in our library all stacked together using YouTube to listen to references of other gun sounds and then kind of just making something like a fun sounding punchy kind of gun. So uh, having people say that they enjoy the sounds of the guns is quite uh, it's quite a nice thing because they're not like they're not recorded from the real gun, you know, in like a real environment, but they've been made by me and Cubase from layering, sampling, all that kind of stuff and synthesizing and stuff. So, yeah. Actually, I think that worked out to your benefit because with the top-down camera or the isometric camera the way it is, it kind of gives that feeling that you're hearing the gun shot from a little bit further away when you're actually looking at the character. I think that's what makes me enjoy the gun shots um, as much as I do. Yeah, yeah and awesome. honestly, the reverb and the Doppler effect you guys have put in, uh, especially for those of us with surround sound uh, headsets, I, the sound design on this game has done so well so well um and yeah, i really we appreciate did, the care we did something that i'm not sure if you know but there's actually two settings on there so the default way is actually the ears so you've obviously got your headphones on and you've got mm -hmm. a left and right ear but how the game audio is set up so say if you hear a gunshot sound in your left ear that will be on the left ear of your character so not your left side of your screen so some people took a while to get used to that. There is an option that you can change that. So it plays like a first person shooter, you know, left and right kind of um, stereo vibe. But yeah, some people were like, zombies are coming from a different direction. They're sounding all around. I'm like, no, but it depends what way your character is facing because your character faces the crosshair. So if your character's like left ear is facing like up towards the screen, then that's where the zombie's coming from if it's coming in your left ear. So that takes people a while to kind of get used to. And I love that because I like being able to experiment with camera angles and rotation, especially since we role play. So, you know, that brings up a interesting thing. Talking about all these beautiful game features is that you guys actually put a roadmap out uh, back actually in uh, no November uh of last year and the roadmap actually has quite a few features in your guys's updates that have been actually fully pushed you have multi-story buildings it looks like you guys have added new weapons there's quality of life improvements there's tons of bug fixes what uh what are your what's the future of your game um looking like because you have accomplished a lot in your past roadmap is there possibly a new roadmap coming out soon yeah so since then, obviously, a lot's happened, as you've just explained. We've done quite a few updates. Um, so we're kind of going to release, basically delete all the stuff that we've done, keep the stuff that we still got in, and then we've got some extra stuff to be added to that. So um, with being on vacation and stuff like that and wanting to get this update out, which is coming really fast in the next couple of weeks or whenever we're, whenever we're watching or listening to this podcast, um, so, and then after that, I'm going to be releasing the, um, the roadmap. I, th I thought it was an interesting choice uh, and, and a respected choice to do full controller support before moving to console support, because I'm, I'm what I call a hybrid player. There are some games I prefer to play with just the controller, and there's some games I prefer to play with the keyboard and mouse. And yeah. having that flexibility is great for us PC gamers but it also helps you guys answer a lot of the core mechanical issues around playing on a console before you even handle the hardware issues and launching on console. What was your, what's your motivation um, with doing the full controller support before console support? Was it the trying to tackle that before the hardware issues or was it that even some of the guys in your team prefer controllers? a little bit of everything probably the main thing would be can this game work on console is probably the question like we're like 100 percent committed to doing it um it's not easy um so yeah the, the main purpose was can we get full control support on pc where it feels like you're playing on a console if we can we're good to go and then we can push over to the hardware stuff and all that kind of thing so um and like i've got friends who i got into daisy because i played daisy way back in the day and my mates were like card fifa and that was it like xbox that's all they kind of played i was like you gotta play daisy it'll come out one day and then it came out on xbox 
and I never really join them anymore because I'm too busy working on the game. So like once a week, I'll dive into a game of DayZ on the console with a controller, and it's great just to kick back on the sofa and play rather than kind of be at your desk, you know, with like your keyboard and mouse, even though obviously shooting's great with a keyboard and mouse. There's something about chilling with a controller as well. Um, and I feel like Humanity is like, weirdly can be quite a chill game if you want it as well. It's quite, I hear people say that a lot. Like they, they, there's a guy I've been watching recently who's a big Daisy streamer. He switches over to Humanity because he just feels like it's, you know, he can go crazy on there or he can kind of chill out. And I was like, yeah, that's probably a good way to sort of push that controller where you can kick back with your buddies. And the Steam Deck is the same thing. It's a controller, basically. So that's kind of where we're at. Yeah, I really appreciated that approach because I always feel like I get forgotten about when it's like, well, I like controller too. Can I can I use controller in this game? It's like, no, this is a PC game. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think the hardest part for us at the minute is the combat and the shooting. Like everything else we can make work, right? The buttons, the menu, movement, driving, looting, you know, interaction, all that kind of stuff. But it's getting that feeling of like if you're taking on 20 zombies and you're like good at the game, you can handle it, you know, jumping over walls and shooting and switching to your melees and stuff like that we want to try and get that feeling in a controller and it's, it's getting there. It's nearly there. We keep changing it all the time. So that is one thing that we kind of want some feedback on, which I'm going to sort of announce to the community soon that we're probably going to do a big update on the controller with some different options for them to try. So that's something to look out for if you're a, a controller console player or whatever that might be. Yeah, I was sitting there thinking about it, too, because I was discussing with somebody. They said, if this was controller support, how would you handle the crosshair movement? Because it's left to right. Of course, that's going to be what your main focus is when you're shooting. Maybe left stick moving, right stick to to look. But then they go, well, sometimes you need to move your crosshair forward and backwards. Because it started as a twin stick shooter. That was mm -hmm. like the genre of humanity when it was in its prototype stage. It's that kind of rotating shoot and then we added the camera rotation a little bit later on in development so that's kind of what's made it tricky where at the minute you use the lbrb to rotate the camera but then you're using like you say the thumbsticks to actually move the crosshair and move the player so it is quite like quite you know it feels quite complex in your hands if you know what i mean so there's right. not much way around that at the minute but we're, we're working on it very awesome. I uh, I actually am very interested in your guys' in-game music player. Is that already in, or is that still in work in progress? That's in work in progress. Sweet. So what kind of music do you guys think you're going to be putting on? Because I know plenty of people who love to listen to tunes and stuff when they're playing games. And uh, I do know uh, quite a few of my streaming buddies would love to do that, but at the same time, they want to make sure that if they accidentally hit, hit play or whatever, it's not going to play possible DMC music. So are you guys going to be making original music or licensing? So there's, there's two sides to it. So we're going to add like um, a music player in the setting. So at the minute, we've just got the one humanity sort of theme tune that kind of plays. And if you're, you know, a veteran of the game, you've probably muted it by now because, you know, no one you know can listen to the same music forever over and over so we're gonna add some more um background ambient stuff to the game that you can just have on loop it's not gonna sort of play in a scenario you know where you know the bandits come and then it changes to like drums and stuff like that it's just gonna be yeah. you know it can be on loop it'll be on random or whatever but then the other side of the music player is we're going to potentially look at adding cds as collectibles in the game mm. so you can either play them play them in the car or you can have a cd player that you can find in houses and stuff like that and you can have them at your base so one it's a collectible side of the game it's like i found this you know rock and roll tune or this dance track or whatever it is and then you can play those tracks in the game that does bring an interesting question, though. Will cars have CD players or be able to tune into a radio? They will have, yeah, they're going to have CD players in car. Yeah, no radio, but yeah, because the radios will be like, it's what 
like a couple of years into the apocalypse. So yeah, there'll be no unless there's like zombie FM or something like that. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, some guy like in the middle of like a house going, guys, I just want to let you know I'm still alive. Pirate it radio, was, yeah. It was it was yeah. it was the Reese's kit bars. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know what, folks? Yo, um, Yaza has hinted at something very early on. He kind of said it a little bit quickly, but he said something about a quest system. I suppose you want some info on the quest system, right? Only if you can give us some. We'll take a little bits of it. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, um, I think it's so. Yeah, it's actually tomorrow. So tomorrow we're gonna. I'm saying tomorrow online on these podcasts, it, it feels weird, but I'm saying it anyway. So, mm-hmm. so tomorrow we're um, releasing uh, experimental. It's going to be like the fastest experimental we've ever done because on the 15th of, uh, yeah, it's Monday. Yeah, so on Monday, we're going to be releasing the full update. So we've literally got like four days experimental and then we're going to push live. Um, there's an event on Steam that we're in and it just kind of works well for us. The update's kind of ready to go. We feel it's in a good place. And it's a a base building update, um, Mm -hmm. allowing you to upgrade your wall. So like at the minute in Humanity, I'm going to get the quest this minute, but I just thought I'd give you a little bit of a tip bit on this. So like beforehand, you'd have like a wood wall, a metal wall, you know, a wall with like the barbed wire and all that kind of stuff. Where now is you just get one wall, you build it out of wood, and that's like the base. And then if you find some barbed wire, you can add that barbed wire to that fence. If you find sheet metal, Ooh. you can stick it on. If you find concrete, and then eventually you can build this like fortress from the wood frame <laughs> right up to like, you know, like a proper beastie wall. So that's going to be that update. And then quickly following that is going to be the quest system because we're already testing it right now on our development build. Um, there's going to be some law in there, uh, friendly NPCs. So there'll be like survivor camps around the map. You can kind of go there, interact with them. Um, There's going to be a few little fetch quests in there. Like they're in every quest system. So, you know, try not to hate us too much. You know, get me this, bring me that, do that. But we are, um, there's some really good quest lines in there for stuff like, you know, people might be infected. You've got to go and get this. And then you've got like timeline, you know, time limit to get this guy fixed and, um, there's going to be limited um, items that you cannot get. So like awesome weapons, armor, different types of clothing, different items that you will not be able to find like in the world. These are only going to come from completing quest lines. So that's a little bit of a taster on the quest line for you. With the questing system, is that going to impact you with rewards of goods, or do you see it more adding a skill point or you know progressing that part of your development for a reward? So a bit of a bit of everything. So we're looking to either expand the skill tree system or delete it and start again from like scratch and maybe have more of a progression system in there, which would help tie in with the quests because we you are going to get xp for doing certain quests you will get a skill point here and there depending on the difficulty of the quest system um certain npcs as well just be kind of walking around and you'll be able to speak to every single one of them some of them might just give you a conversation and no quest line but there might be some like lore in there but then later on in the game where you've maybe completed some quests it's always going to be good to speak to everyone in this game because later on they might be a quest giver that you might just think oh it's just a dumb npc and just going to ignore him he might have like some really awesome quests later on down the line so there's going to be a lot of gated stuff we're not going to like sort of say hey guys there's a quest system 10 hours you should be kind of done that's what we're not hoping for um and what we plan to do is every single update after the quest system we're going to give new quests with every single update as well. So, and you know what? The one thing I love about this quest system that you're hinting at and giving us some details about is it really plays into what you said earlier, where you don't want there to be an end game. You want the players to continue to play it and that kind of situation. And you're not creating a quest system to tell a crazy storyline so it feels like players finishing the game, but rather 
there are things to do in the world and people to interact with. And you're creating more of a livable world than just you're the only survivor and everyone's a bad guy kind of situation. And I enjoy that. I mean, of course, there's the friendly trader, but like you're actually creating true dialogue with the world. I, I enjoy that. When it comes to base building, though, can, can, can I get use of one of the tractors so I can build like a car wall, like off Mad Max or something, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's my base wall. Bunch of well, there's, cars. there's car modification coming, isn't there? So. Ooh. Mm. I was going to say, come on, drawing. just park. <laughs> all we got to do is steal all the running cars in the entire cityscape and bring them down and make our own mobile wall. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, let's go ahead and move on to actually, uh, is it you talking about anything you want to talk about? Shout out. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to give a shout out to um, my team, to be honest, like first. Um, we've been through like lots of ups and downs, um, some pretty like tough things to deal with, like outside of the game, like personal stuff um, for me and a few of the members of the staff and stuff like that. So. Um, like we get some like pretty tasty feedback sometimes, you know, some of some of it negative, obviously, you know, um, and people like expect you to like do stuff like super fast. But like, I think sometimes people think that we're like a triple A studio with like, you know, all driving around in Ferraris with like, you know, 150, you know, people working for me or something like that. And it's like, it isn't like that. Do you know what I mean? We're like, we're building a passion project. You know, this was like a hobby that we kind of dreamt of and now it's kind of happening and it's only happening because we work hard like every single day on the game. You know, we live and breathe it and stuff. So, um, yeah, big shout out to my team, like um, the publishers as well, Freedom. They've helped us a lot, especially in like the early stages of the game, a lot with like helping me, like the, the two members of staff that joined. Um they helped like fund and pay their wages and stuff like that in the early stages. So I know publishers get a lot of bad rep because they're kind of just like money grabbing and all this kind of stuff. That's kind of like the game dev thought on them, but they kind of don't get any, any credit really. Um, so without them, I wouldn't be able to have the game that we've got now because I wouldn't have been able to pay these guys. So, um, there's lots of little things like that. Um, and then a shout out to the community, really. Everyone who like streams the game, plays the game, um, you know, interacts on the Discord um, and sort of supports us and sticks by us. Because, you know, there might be times where we're going to release an update and not everyone's going to like it. Um, but, you know, we've got our vision. We're listening all the time to everybody else around us. Um, and, yeah, the future's bright. We, we're here for, you know, a long time there's no there's no rush there's no panic i think we've had a really good start this is our first like ever game um we're living the dream and yeah was, we're keeping going that is wonderful to hear and i'm so glad that you were able to find a publisher to really help you along with this and amazing team members it sounds like you and your co-owner just like totally got along and it's amazing that you were able to make human c and are continuing to develop it I know that you guys are a small uh, team of six people and you guys are just continuing to improve the game. Absolutely enjoy it. So folks, this is Human Z and we have had one of the fellow co-owners here, Yaza, with us explaining the game and talking about it. This game has gone on sale multiple times, so don't be shy about picking it up for yourself or for a friend and really show people why, in, why you enjoy this game. But thank you all very much for joining us and have a wonderful day. Ta-ta. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having us. Peace.